That's too funny. Steve, I'm going to turn off my camera just to save bandwidth. Uh, they can still see me. They can hear and see you. We're all good. We're glad that everyone's here hanging out. Uh, just before I hit that big red uh, go live button, Steve and I were talking about what different sounds we should get for the show. Of course, we've been playing the glockenspiel there for when we go international. That's been one of our sounds, but um, I, Steve goes, you ought to get a... You ought to get the sound of a uh, of a donkey there. And then what was that sound you made? <laughs> and then I said what we'll do is just we'll we'll take that snippet from today's recording and then we'll put that as the little sound effect that we play when people join us. Oh my goodness, Steve, how's the week going so far? Uh, do, doing all right. We got water into the house now. We've been trenching and we put 600 foot of pipe in from the well to the headquarters, and so we got that done. So next thing we got to do is we got to repipe the whole house. Everything before, when we put the piping in, was underground, and this, the, the electrolysis from the ground with the copper creates problems. And now I got holes all over the place, I guess. And so we're we got to start plumbing. We had we had one leak in our house. And we got, it was just one little teeny tiny leak. And I think they punched about six holes in the wall trying to identify where that leak was coming from. And now we have one tube going from the front of our house all the way above the attic, coming down right behind uh, the commode in the guest bathroom. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah, big old deal. But it got fixed and we're good. And yours, yours will get fixed and it'll be great. But. Yeah. We're not here to talk plumbing. We're here to talk mules and donkeys. Of course, we may have some plumbing questions about mules and donkeys. Uh, we almost always have some feed questions, uh, yeah. and we'll be happy to get to those. But before we get to the questions, let's say hi to everyone who's joining us. We've got over on YouTube, we've got Richard watching from Palestine, Texas. It's 444 Central Time. 444 Central Time? 4. 4 o'clock Central Time. Uh, yeah, there should, you go. Should be, this should be interesting, Crystal says. Missouri Heartland here. Crystal, we are so glad that you're here. My guess is this is your first time hanging out with us, so welcome. Very thrilled that you're joining us over on YouTube. And for everyone who is watching for the first time, we do this every Wednesday. Uh, Steve has been working with mules since 81. He's been training mules since 92. and uh, Or tra training mules since 81, but has been giving professional instructions uh, on uh, helping other folks train and work with their mules and donkeys since uh, around 92. And so we get together for an hour and we just answer questions. Sometimes it's about feed, sometimes it's about saddles, tack, uh, behavior, all sorts of things. So Crystal, we're glad that you're here. Uh, Kate is watching from Australia. All right, we've gone international already. We're so glad that you're here, Kate. Uh, David Walls from Kentucky missed you all the last couple of times. David, we missed you too, and we are super glad that you were able to catch us today and we're able to spend a little time together. Uh, let's see here. Uh, over on Facebook, who is hanging out with us on Facebook? David and Di Scholl are watching on Facebook, so we've gone international again. It's good to have you all joining us. Uh, Steve, for all those who are just joining for the first time, Steve actually spent some time in Australia uh, last month, uh, went down there, met David and Di, uh, built a relationship, went down there. Uh, and worked with a lot of mule and donkey folks uh, uh, down under. And it was a great trip. And uh, we posted some pictures on Steve's Facebook page so y'all can check it out there. Yolanda's joining us. I think we're more international than we are uh, domestic here. That's great. Cal Boykins here from Connecticut. Marianne Page from Colorado. David Pingelli from Sonoya, Sino Georgia. Uh, Dottie Sweeting. Howdy from Cords Lakes, Arizona. And Lou Tarango, Oklahoma here. So we've got a good mixture of people here. Folks, let me tell you how this works. We're going to answer questions. Where do those questions come from? Well, I've got a short list here that come in throughout the week on email, but the majority of the questions come from you. So we want you first and foremost to introduce yourself, put your name, where you're watching, and what the weather's like there out here in Arizona. It's finally hit triple digits. It's uh, clear skies out there. A couple degrees cooler on the ranch, isn't it, Steve? Yeah, I think it's right around 100 degrees here right now. Yeah. Yeah, but nice. The, the the ranch gets a real nice breeze because, of course, you don't have oh, yeah. all the buildings and everything obstructing the uh, obstructing the bridge, uh, the breeze, and it's real nice. Uh, so share your name, where you're watching from, 
and what the weather's like. The second thing we ask is that you ask any and all of your questions. Your questions are what drives this program. Uh, we answer a lot of the same questions week after week, and we love it because the repetition is very important. And you might hear something one week and it didn't make sense. Hear the same question asked another week and it just makes sense. So ask your questions. And the third thing is we ask that you sh like and share the broadcast. If you're over on YouTube, go ahead and subscribe and like. If you're on Facebook, click like and then go ahead and click that share button and we'll get in it front of some other people. Steve, what's in the cup today? Oh, well, we got just good old uh, well water from Queen, Queen Valley, Valley Mute Ranch. Ranch. Well water. In the Love other it. day, yes, sir. Awesome. awesome. Water. Well, let's get to the first question. This one comes from Carl. Carl's watching over on Facebook. He says, my mule wants to turn and bolt when afraid of something or doesn't want to cross a ditch. What's the best way to address this and help this mule? I love it that he wants to help the mule. How do we do it? You betcha. Okay, so turning and bolting when he's afraid of something, that's part of being an equine. It's called flight and fright. Happens all the time. They can be one time be going north. Everything's going within great and then if, uh, just within a split seconds, they can turn on their hindquarters and go, going back going south. That's the way it is. But it has to be you, the rider, that is able to keep them going in the direction you want them to go. So, so you know, it's, you know how you're going down the highway on, on the, with your truck? You got both hands on the steering wheel, hopefully, mm -hmm. and you're going down the road. Mm -hmm. And then you steer according to the road and this sort of thing. If you let go of that steering wheel, what happens? The truck goes wherever it wants. When you let go of those reins, in other words, you don't have a proper control with those reins, then this mule is going to go where it wants to go. And what you have to remember is when you're riding two-handed, that's called direct reining. That is for training only. It is not for going down the trail. If you're going to be training, then direction, impulsion, direction, impulsion. That's training. But a lot of folks have both hands on the reins all the time, and it constantly puts pressure upon the mule. But let's go back to the turn and bolting. That's part of life. You cannot change it, but what you can do is train it. So what I usually do is uh, I start all of my mules in a sur single, and I put the, the uh, mule riders martingale on them, and I let them get soft in the face. The biggest problem with the majority of our mules and donkeys today is we do not have them soft in the face. We keep thinking, let's change bits, let's change bits, let's change bits. That's not the bit. It is the hands that help the bit. And also, I, you gotta put this together too, it's imperative that your teeth get floated and your teeth are balanced every single year. Don't let some vet tell you, don't need to get done. There's always gonna be points and it needs to get done every single year. That way, just like the four tires on your car, if they all have the correct amount of air, they are going to go down the road good and they're gonna wear correctly. Same thing with the mouth on your mule. If you'll take and balance the teeth, Get them balanced up good, it'll work good. So you're riding and you're going and you're riding. And all of a sudden, your mule, you can feel in your hand, in on one hand, you can feel him pull on your hand a little bit. Well, that means his nose is coming up. That means he's trying to see what's going on. Listen, it's up to you, the rider, to keep the mule straight on the trail. So, if the mule looks to the left, bump him to the right. If he looks to the right, bump him to the left. Now, if, we're, if they're soft in the face, and you do your sur single work, and the mule respects the bit that you have, then when you're going down the trail, it's really easy to communicate to the animal. See, one of the reasons that the mule would turn and, and go the other way is because he's frightened of something up there. Something has a concern for him. So, when he looks up and he's saying, I want to see what's going on, you take you take your hands and direct reining, and you go right, left, right, left, and you drop his head. Do not allow them to look around because they will look for monsters, especially when you have the point mule. You are riding the very front mule. That's the point mule. And it's very, very easy for them to see a monster, turn and go, okay? Now you come up to water, the same thing. 
when you come up to water now and you want to cross it, do not cross it with using, trying to make them go straight across with, with both brains. You see, they, they have a peripheral problem in that they don't know the depth of the water. So until they know the depth of the water, they don't really want to go in. Now, here's what a lot of people do. They'll say, they'll have another meal and say, all right, you, know, you go ahead and go, and then I'll cross with you. Well, you see, that's all well and good. The meal went across the water, but he didn't do it on your cue. And if you're by yourself someday or need to cross the water sometime or another, you got to have another mule take him across? No. Or somebody will take the lead one across, and you will hold on, and they'll lead him across. Don't do that. Learn to communicate using your voice, hands, legs, and your seat. That is using equitation. So with my legs, I'm going to be giving them acceleration. With my hands, I'm going to be keeping them straight, straight, straight. And I'm going to go to the, to the left, and then I'm going to go to the right, and then I'm going to go to the left, and then I'm going to go to the right. And then pretty soon, every time I, I get going, I'm going to be thinking about going straight across the water. What people tend to do, Dave, is they tend to go in circles. Well, they'll come up and say, okay, you don't want to go that way. Well, let's go do a circle. Mm -hmm. Do not do circles on your mules. Horses, horse people do that all the time. Listen. You get on a tight place on the side of a mountain, go to the Grand Canyon, you ain't going to be able to go around a circle to fix the problem. So you go straight, a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right, a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. And pretty soon, the right brain sees it, the left brain sees it, the right brain sees it, the left brain sees it. And as long as you're thinking going forward using your legs, when you go to the right, your left leg hits. When you go to the left, your right leg hits. So you've got acceleration, and you've got your hands giving direction. That's good. Very good. Hopefully that answers some of your question there, Carl. Um, there's a lot to it. There's a lot of working pieces. And one of the things that we love about doing this show is the fact that uh, it, it gives you proven instruction that you can go and use rather than trying to work it out on your own and just a combination of things because what happens and we see this time and time again and Steve correct me if I'm wrong but you may feel like you fix one problem but because the mule has such a big tolerance they don't react to pain the way we react to pain you create two three four problems that you don't wind up seeing until three four six maybe even a year down the road and it can all be traced back to that one correction that you made. That's that's right, Steve. If I've understood you correctly. Yeah, that's that's exactly correct. You know, we'll we'll take and we'll we'll get a bigger bit, and we'll say, okay, uh, now we got the bigger bit. Now we're going to stop them. No, no, no. It is your hands. So let's just say, let's just say we we take and say, okay, the uh, we create two wrinkles or one wrinkle up in the mouth, thinking, okay, now we can we can stop him. But he gets his tongue over top of the bit. Well, now we're thinking that's bad, and it's not. It's not good. And then we take and we raise it up a little bit higher. Now we got two wrinkles. He can still get his tongue over top. All you're doing is teaching him to by by raising it up. You're teaching him to go through the bit. What you don't do is raise it up. You lower it. You lower the bit to where he has to pick it up and carry it. If I never create one wrinkle or two wrinkles. I always allow the mule to pick up the bit. I allow the donkey to pick up the bit and to carry it. I start with the snaffle bit first because it is the lightest of the bits. <coughs> I didn't want to go into my finished bit. That's a little heavier, but he still learns to pick it up and carry it. And they do it. And they do that because what happens is when you start going right, left, right, left with your hands, it makes their bars uncomfortable. So they'll put their tongue back underneath the bit to protect their bars. They're not stupid. They're extremely smart. So if you take and uh, uh, keep them from, from creating more bad habits, you see, you create a bad habits by trying to raise the bit up, not knowing. But if you lower it, then you, you keep from having all those other bad habits of getting a tongue over top of the bit, running through the bit, running sideways, and this sort of thing. That's good. 
Great. Uh, we've had a lot more folks join us uh, since uh, since we took that first question. Here we've got Gail from Southeast Coastal North Carolina. We've got Joy from Maryboro. Uh, QLD. Where is Australia. QLD? Australia. Queensland. Yep. That's what it is. QLD, yep. Queensland. All right, there we go. Hey, international so, again. Let's get that glockenspiel going there. We've got uh, Allie saying, hey there. Allie, it's good to have you. We've got Ben watching from North Carolina. Uh, Karen from Raymond, California. We've got D. Good afternoon, guys. Hot here in Camp Verde, but still riding. That's what we like to hear, D. Uh, let's see. Uh, Linda's watching. Linda, the mule servant, and Theo, the sweet one-eyed mule here in warm but cloudy central Ohio. A little red wine in my cup. She's giving a little wink there. We've got uh, Joy who says, love the shirt, Steve. Steve, tell us about the shirt and the hat real quick. Well, hey, this hat is from Australia. Along with the hat comes the shirt. And it, I, I believe it's like the Australian uh, Australian Donkey and Mule Association or something like that. But this is the shirt they gave me. Uh, Dave and Di gave to me. That's and great. This is the hat. This is genuine rabbit fur right here hat. Giddy up. That uh, Dave and Di gave to me. And uh, I'm I'm genuine Australian today. All right then, yeah. <laughs> that was a little more British than it was Australian. I sure hope they, I sure hope they don't get mad at me. Okay, let's see here. We've got uh, we've got Dan watching from San Augustine. We've got Sherry watching from Pensacola, Florida. We've got Sharon here in Upstate New York. You're the best. Keep it up, Steve. Carol says hi and thanks for returning her calls. All right. Uh, let's see. Cass says I don't have a mule yet. But I just love listening to Steve. This is so informative. That's great, Cass. And that's the number one thing that if you were to ask Steve right now, I don't have a mule yet. What should I be doing? You're already doing it. Learning. Taking in the information. It's one thing to hear it. It's another thing to go out there. But by golly, you're going to be so much further ahead of the game having listened having learned, and then go out and apply. So good for you. Uh, Lane is here. He says, do you use a mechanical hackamore? Hackamores have been something we've talked about quite a bit. Steve, talk real quick about your thoughts on the hackamore because I know you have some. Yes, I, I love a hackamore. I love a mechanical hackamore. I, I, I only put a mechanical hackamore on a mule or donkey that has a solid foundation. In other words, See, mules and donkeys care more about their nose than they do their mouth. So when you put a hackamore on a mule or a donkey's nose, you better not use it much because the more you use it, the more you can irritate their nose and then they get upset at you and they'll run away and it can be pretty tough. So what am I saying? If you can ride 80% off of your legs, side pass, turn on the forehand, turn on the hindquarters, a light stop, a light backup, then you can use a mechanical hackamore and only use a mechanical hackamore one-handed. When you're using two, you're putting a lot of pressure upon that mule and donkey's nose, one-handed. They're very sensitive about their nose, folks. Look, when you want to fix something, you pretty much use their nose to do it. So you're leading them with a lead rope and uh, they all of a sudden want to run off well you give them a couple sharp jerks and that lead rope has is attached to the come along hitch and that come along hitch pulls on the pole and across the nose and a few bump bumps tells them don't do it and you're doing that through the nose through the nose the communication there so uh, a mechanical hackamore also you want to have a quality mecha mechanical hackamore yeah unfortunately there's so many hackamores out there right now that people uh, people just don't know that they need to be made correctly in order to have balance on the mule's nose. You know, so I have uh, I, I have one particular one I like to use, and it's a bicycle chain with a rubber nose piece on it. It's very nice, gives a lot of feel, and it's made right here in the United States. <laughs> Uh, by uh, Rainsman. Rainsman. Yeah, and it's one that I designed, and it's a nice. It's a. It's got a lot of nice feel to it. But you want to be very, very, very careful what you do with that hackamore. <laughs> and the adjustment on it 
is going to depend upon the donkey, the mule's ability to communicate. Always remember, the nose needs to be on the vertical. The nose is not sticking out. Always remember, the head is down. The head is not up. If you have a mule and a donkey that has a nose on the vertical and the head down, that means they respect the bit, they respect the hackamore, they respect the halter, and they're doing what they're supposed to do. Great. Uh, yeah, it seems like we're having more and more conversations about the hackamore, so we'll make sure to get this uh, get this chopped up and put up on YouTube so folks can find it. Um, let's see here. We've got, man, just a lot of folks joining us today. Karen's here from Virginia. Good to have you here, Karen. Uh, we got another Karen. We've got our other Karen. Uh, that, so it's Karen Heatwall. And then Karen Whitehead says, last week someone had a question of fixing pine. I came in at the end of it, and I thought I heard you mention a dog collar that can vibrate a bit. Could you give a little bit more info on this? So just to get people caught up, last year, last year, last week, we had a question about um, about different behavior, and Steve said you could get a dog collar, and you don't put it on the shock, you put it on the vibrate, and you can't train this stuff out of them, but you can use it as a cue. And so that's where we left off. Steve, go ahead. Okay, so pine basically is, is they want something. They want to, they paw ice to get, the, get to water when it's frozen. They paw snow so that they can uh, get the snow off of the uh, of grass so that they can eat. And it's also, it, it is, I don't want to be here. I'm pawing in the trailer. I don't want to be here. I'm pawing at the hitching rail. I don't want to be here. So how do, my favorite way to fix it is this. I take a dog collar and I put it above the knee on the left and on the right side with about 10 inches of chain hanging down off that dog collar, heavy chain, real heavy. And so that when they paw, it, it, uh, it hits on their cannon bone and makes them uncomfortable. Yeah. Now, now. Here, this is what's really important. Also, take some baling twine and go from the dog collar on the right up over top the neck, the dog collar on the left, to keep that uh, dog collar from going down. Because what happens is, as they go to paw him, it works its way loose and drops down to the ankle. Uh, and so that's what you don't want. So here's the deal. You do not leave these uh, chains on. When they stop pawing, reward them by taking the hobbles, the, the chains off, and hang them on a nail right where they can see them, or hang them on the corral right where they can see them. They'll understand that at that spot, now hear this, at that spot, they do not paw. But let me tell you something, folks. You move these mule and donkeys over two feet, it's a new spot. It's a new world, so you've got to do it again. It is not a permanent fix because this is one of the things that the good Lord put into these animals was so that they can they can get what they want. And just like flight and fright, uh, the running off, the bucking, the biting, they all buck, they all bite, they all kick. Get that in your mind. But going back to this, the pawing, they will understand that in this spot, they do not paw. Now, the other thing I like to do like on my hitch and rail, uh, I put down rubber mat all the way across. And when they paw, they're only pawing on the rubber mat. Now, when do I use the vibrating dog collar, which you have to use, you have to add an extra strap to it. I do it when they are trying to paw the gate, for instance. Uh, I, I don't want them to be able to walk in these things. Uh, they need to be able to be standing s still. But uh, I use the dog collar the very last thing. I try not to, to use it at all. Uh, the, the chains is the best way to go. If they go to paw when you're taking the feed to them, then don't put the feed down. Don't reward them for what they're wanting because they're saying, hurry up, put that feed down. Now, back a few years ago, I had a friend of mine feeding while I was off doing some clinics. And, uh, and so he would feed the mules each morning. Well, this mule would go to pawing, so he'd feed him really quick. Then this mule would go to pawing, and he'd go feed him really quick. 
Well, pretty soon, every mule in the whole place was pawing because yeah. they wanted to hurry and get their feed. So yeah. he rewarded them. So we, when when they go to paw, don't give them their feed. There you go. Can't get it out of them, but you can train it. You can yeah. uh, do things to kind of help cope with it and help teach them. Um, I like what you said there about when you move them, it's a new spot, but it's also a new world. Can you talk a little bit about that? I've never heard you. I've never heard you mention that before. Yeah, it, actually, you see, you know, they they're in their little world right here on this one spot, but you have to remember they are on the bottom of the food chain, and so they have to be able to be aware of problems everywhere they go. So they move just a few feet. They're looking for monsters. That's why it's important for us to ride them to help them through. So as soon as they move just a few feet, they think it's a new spot and they'll go to pawing or moving or something like that. And we have to cue them. Now, do not, do not, do not hobble their front end to make them stand still at a hitching rail. When I hobble my mules, it's because I've trained them to stand still perfectly still but it's only stand still for a few minutes when I when I train one to stand still at a hitching rail I adjust a halter I only give them 10 inches of chain and let them move right and left when that when that rope halter hits them and it makes them uncomfortable because it's adjusted correctly and boom you get results where they only think about straight and that's a good thing to do to teach one to be straightness on the trail that's great. Um, Steve does have a video on hobbling. He, since he mentioned it there a couple times, um, he, I'm putting the link in there just for folks who may be interested in that. Um, but uh, let's see here. We've got Stephanie from Missouri watching. We've got uh, Margie from Alabama. We've got Jim from Kingsport, Tennessee. Raining here in East Tennessee. We've got Tina from Georgia. We've got Ginger from Georgia. We've got Vicki from Tennessee. Lots of Tennessee in the house. And uh, let's see, over here on YouTube, we've got, uh, well, let's see, Mark Miller, uh, Sarah Kay. Uh, we've got uh, Richard saying they got seven inches of rain last night. Oh, my goodness. Kimberly says, hello, hello from Kimberly in Queen Creek. I missed you guys. So glad to see you're safe. Thank you, Kimberly. Uh, we got a question from Jarrett over on YouTube. Jarrett says, hi, Dave and Steve. How would you prepare a mule to pack game? Also, how would you work with a mule that's afraid of meat? Yeah. Well, number one, Jared, when I when I pack my meat, you got to remember they got the smell. They can already smell that elk. Uh, they can already smell that deer from a long ways away. And and I can tell you that like on my wife's good old mule, she packed all kinds of meat. But one day she decided this one particular elk, she wasn't going to pack it. No way in the world. And she had packed a lot of them, you know, but it happened to be that there was something about this one. So uh, I ended up uh, like I do most of my meat anyway. Uh, but with her, I had no problem. I would just put them in a in in uh, pillow sacks, meat sacks, and haul them away. But my favorite thing to do is to take black plastic bags, put my meat inside the black plastic bags, and only for a short time. Because the downside of the black plastic bag is it will make, uh, it will, doesn't allow air to flow through and your meat will break down quicker so you can lose it. But I put it in plastic bags, that'll help it. And then I put it inside my panniers and then I put the panniers up just like I always do. Uh, and he's used to doing that, okay? Uh, always the come along hitch. So if he's moving around, put the come along hitch on him, give him a few bumps. Tell their feet to stand still, and uh, and that really makes a big difference. Always use the come long hitch when you're training. When I go hunting and this sort of thing, you never know when these animals are going to be afraid of something, and the come long hitch gives you the ability to make their feet stand still. So talk a little bit more just on how you would prepare them. You use the come along hitch, get their feet to stand still. Is there anything that you would do before you you get out there i mean just go into that in a little bit more detail I've, I'm, I'm taking no. my mule out for the first time uh to pack game what would you say yeah. well here's the thing you know we 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 used to put hides across the uh uh the the corral panels 
<coughs> right where they right where they eat to get them to go up to the to the hide and uh, on their own and that kind of worked a little bit but here's the thing folks I've seen some of these mules go two or three days without food because they're not gonna go nowhere near that hide and especially like a, a lion or a bear hide but you know you'll have some mules some donkeys that just no problem at all whatever you put on me is fine but you'll have some others you're gonna be on the fight so the, the best thing you can do folks don't 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 think you're gonna desensitize them so that okay once you desensitize them then by golly you got it made but how many of you have an elk to desensitize a live elk or how many of you have a rattlesnake to desensitize you don't okay uh, how many of you got a deer to desensitize you don't because here's what happens just because you quote desensitize them to one thing there's going to be 10,000 other things that they're going to be afraid of because they're an equine flight because of fright and that happens all the time all the time so with the come along hitch it makes them feet stand still I've tried rubbing blood on their nose I've put Vicks on their nose I've done all that stuff they can still smell that blood you know I've put blood on the, the hitching rails I've tried all kinds of stuff the best thing you can do is take your come along with you and when you're packing them up if they become a problem a couple of bumps on their nose tells them to stand still and away you go very good appreciate that Jarrett hopefully that's helpful um, don't talk a whole lot about hunting but Steve is a uh, is a is a hunter and is, is an avid gamesman uh, give me a couple things that uh, that you've uh, a, a couple um, trophies that you've got last couple years or so well uh, just I uh, got a, an elk hanging on the wall over there it's uh, for those who know how to measure one it's uh, three three hundred and seventy eight inches so it's a 378 and a quarter and that's that's a monster bull it's a lifetime trophy to get um, I've got several deer and bear uh, and this sort of thing um, I uh, yeah I've harvested I've harvested a little bit of everything yeah. and I like to eat good good game meat I prefer the the game meat over over most about everything and I enjoy traveling out there and getting to sample some of that every now and again when you've got something uh got something good waiting that's good stuff the sausage yeah. sausage is Elk good. jerky and that sort of thing yeah. you betcha uh all right let's see phillips watching from arkansas gary green's here you've used the term one or two wrinkles can you clarify what a wrinkle is so we're talking bits here and then yep. wrinkle so wrinkles in the corner of the mouth when you and this is folks this is very very important because this one problem here can create mega problems so you put the bit on pre-adjusted every day you never adjust it down everybody does that they take it on and off all the time when you do that you're bumping the bars of the mouth you're making the corners of the mouth uncomfortable and this sort of thing you're not meaning to do it but it does happen and so what happens is the mule the donkey starts saying well wait a minute you're pulling on me right here like this and that don't feel very good and then you pull on the ear over and then you put the other ear in there well all of a sudden now the mule the donkey throws back and you think he's ear shy no what you've done is you pulled on his mouth so anytime I pull a bridle off I always loosen it up two notches just on the one side maybe even three notches and I ask the head to drop down and and to the left always have the head down down listening to you being submissive head down tip to the left when it's tip to the left the left brain's thinking of you when the head is down loosens all five major neck muscles makes them soft so when the head is down I loose up the bridle two three notches I come off the right ear first and then I come off the left ear and I come off it nice and smooth and easy then when I put the bridle on I put it on loose I do not put it to the same place every single time when I put the bridle on they'll pick it up and they'll pack it they will create one wrinkle or two wrinkles on the mouth they will create no wrinkles on the mouth <coughs> but the great thing about it folks is they then will will show you where they're the most comfortable and the bit fits them the best you got to remember uh, David 
Most of these people that are that are riding their mules are riding their mules with a horse bit, mm -hmm. smooth snaffle, or some other type of bit that's out there. And there's a lot of them. Most of them all made in in Pakistan and and this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And they're replicas of what we have here. But going back to this, that palate is different on that mule and donkey than what it is with the horse. Now, yes, you're getting some things done. But, folks, you are riding a Lexus. And that Lexus will do a whole lot nicer when their mouth is correct, they've got their teeth correct, they're balanced and this sort of thing, and the correct bit is in their mouth with the correct reins and the correct head stall. The head straw, stall balances the bit. The reins balance the bit. Those all have to be correct in order to have smooth, easy communication to your mule and donkey. Very good. Uh, next question here is from Margie over on Facebook. I have a rescue mule that has two scars on her tongue. What would you suggest to ride with? Yeah, unfortunately, you know, folks, Folks that they use smooth snaffle bits thinking they're being nice to their mule and donkey. And so what they do though is they end up having to pull harder and harder because that mule, that donkey, does not respect a smooth snaffle bit. That's why I use a double twisted wire. Far easier to communicate with. It's easier on the mouth. I have demonstrated, well, when I was in Australia, I did a demonstration. They were going, oh, Oh, double twisted wire bit, it's evil. And there was a lady there who was a doctor, and she had donkeys, and she's very well known with her donkeys. And <coughs> I demonstrated by having people put two fingers out, and I put that bit on their on their hand. I said, All right, here's a smooth here's a snaffle bit, feel that pressure. Here's my double twisted fire wire, feel that pressure. And every single one said, Wow, there's no pressure. That's right because it evenly distributes the communication across the tongue. So what do I use for bit? I would have to see the tongue to give you an idea. But personally, I would use my uh, trail rider bit. It does not have any pressure at all on the tongue. It comes up over top of the tongue with a Mona Lisa headpiece, and it goes on the roof of the mouth, roof of the palate. Now, if your donkey, if your mule that you that you got the problem with, is not steering well you don't really want to use that you you really want to get them steering first correctly and that's where you would use my mule riders martingale with that double twist wire snaffle bit it's soft and easy and you got a good feel folks you just don't put a a lot of folks do this and you shouldn't do it they put a finished bit on thinking that the mule will, will communicate and he will do some but the finished bit is when you're riding 20% on your hands, 80% on your legs. Unfortunately, most people are riding two-handed rather than one-handed. Mm -hmm. One-handed is the best for the mule and the donkey. Awesome. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Terry's watching from upstate New York. Thanks for doing this. I enjoy it. Terry, we're so glad that you're here. Uh, Susan's watching from western Pennsylvania. We've got Preaching Cowboy. Hello from Oklahoma. You fellows are sharing some great stuff about mules and donkeys. What do you do to one that seems scared, uh, even jumpy, after a lot of handling? Is this Preacher Cowboy Randy Reasoner? It might be. Preaching Cowboy. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, folks, uh, one thing that you have to think about is a lot of these animals, it's not handling. It's their nature. They're very, very sensitive. And so even thinking about a lot of handling, that doesn't fix the problem. It's their nature. You can't change it. So if they do have that, that moving nature where they're worried about things and this sort of thing, I like to ride that kind of mule because he's not a lazy mule. He wants to go. But I have to ride him. I can't just sit on him and plod down a trail. I can't do that. I have to ride him. So I got some cows to go get, I'm gonna ride that kind of mule. I got some country I gotta cover, I ride that kind of a mule. Folks, desensitizing does not work. It don't work, it don't work. You can desensitize a cow come home, I'll give you an idea. Here for Bishop, for the World Championships, we train 
We pack these meals. We go back in the mountains. We, we train here in the arenas. We got loud music on. We got banners flying. What don't we have? We don't have 10,000 people up in the audience. Yeah. So where are you going to get 10,000 people to, quote, desensitize? You can't. So handling doesn't fix the problem. What fixes the problem is your ability to use your voice, hands, legs, and seat to ride that kind of a mule. Now, not everybody needs to be riding that kind of a mule. Because that mule could sure dump you pretty quick. Just you'd be going north, all of a sudden, zip, you turn south, turn on the hindquarters. I like that because that mule has got a lot of bottom in. Okay? That mule's got a, a, a lot of energy that I like to have. But you have to ride that kind of a mule, and that's really, really important. Yeah, the desensitizing thing, that's something that uh, comes up over and over and over again. And um, I, I think folks' uh, thoughts are in the right place. But when you finally said, when you, where are you going to get a bridge to train with if you don't have one in the back? Where are you going to get a bear? To train with where are you going to get a semi truck to train with no it's yeah. it's ground foundation it's halter yeah. work it's communication and they're going to do what they're going to do all you can do is hope that at that moment you've got good foundation training and they're going to respect the halter they're going to respect the bit right right i'm <coughs> using your voice hands legs and seat yeah now every bridge it's a bridge but every bridge is a little bit different Water's running faster, water's running slower. Uh, a lot of different things. And so that mule and that donkey sees all this going on, and they're thinking, oh, man, this is an awful lot. Wait a minute. You've crossed 100 bridges. What's so different about this one? Well, you don't know what's you know about how the water's rushing, how it's bothering the animal. But that's when you use your legs, and you use your legs upon the animal to give them, give them acceleration, and you put the hands down for going forward. And you ride the mule rather than them showing you what to do. Them telling, taking you where, you where you don't want to go. Yeah, that's good. Uh, let's see here. Over on, uh, we've got Albert Kersey watching from Arkansas. We've got Kate has a question. She says, what is the best bit to use on a donkey for driving in harness? Okay, so as with donkeys, mules, all of them, I'll start first and do my Sir Single work. I cannot tell you enough that Sir Single work is your most important thing. You bid them up, you, you put the Mule Riders Martingale on them, you hook the, the reins up to the, uh, the Sir Single, you put the, the Martingale down onto the cinch, and they walk around and they get soft. They do it on their own. You are not walking behind them, driving them. They are moving and they are getting soft on their own. The driving part, the moving with your hands and stuff is simple. But getting them soft in the face first, all right? Now, <coughs> once you take and you get them soft in the face and you start driving them in the harness. And if you want to walk behind them, you go ahead. I mean, that's fine. I've done it a lot of times myself. Uh, but you walk behind them, and you've got long lines. And I use a double-twisted wire, full-cheek bit. You'll see them there. I've got them on my store. The reason this double-twisted wire is because it's got such an easy way to communicate to the mule's tongue. The full-cheek keeps you from pulling the bit through. Because you have to remember, folks, when you're driving, you have those long lines. That means you've got phenomenal amounts, phenomenal amounts of, uh, of leverage. And so you'll see it on my video communicating with, uh, with the lines. And you'll see the, the little gal sitting next to me, and I show her how she barely moves her hands to do what you want to do. Unfortunately, folks are doing this, like this. And you're creating, this is where we was talking about before, Dave, you do one thing right, but you're creating mega problems. Right. So when you pull on them, you make them run through their shoulder. You pull on them, you make them run through their shoulder. You know. Plus, when you pull on them, every time you pull on a mule or donkey, you teach them to brace. They t sure they make their turn. You pull them, you put so much pressure on them they had to, but they also learn to tighten all five major neck muscles. 
they learn to tighten their throat latch. So across the crest of the neck, the muscles are down through the middle of the, of the neck, one along the esophagus, and two along the shoulder. Those get tight. And when they get tight, the mule's just trying to protect himself. The donkey's just trying to keep you from pulling on him and doing like this other lady. The scars on the tongue, I've literally seen the tongue almost cut off, you know, because of people making mistakes. So once my mule and my donkey is going very good in a double twisted wire full cheek bit, I then I then uh, go to driving them in a liver pull bit. Has lots of adjustment. There's lots of abilities to go softer and things like this. And I always want to go softer. But remember this. Four to six hours of training a week is a lot of training. You do not. I want to emphasize this. Do not need to train every day. All you're going to do is create a mule or a donkey that does not want to, to, to work with you. Make them happy. Give them a, a fun things to do when they're doing this stuff. Um, and, and you'll have a lot happier animal. <clears throat> so that's kind of the foundation that I do. The video there, uh, communicating through the lines, yeah. uh, Dave, would be a, a really good one for folks to have a look at. I put that in the comments section. Folks, if this is your first time watching, welcome. My name's Dave. This is Steve Edwards. Every Wednesday, we do a live mule and donkey clinic. It's uh, especially great right now because uh, it's not uh, ideal for everybody to get together in one place, big groups. And so it, yeah. it makes getting together and, and doing this uh, all the more timely. But uh, we get together every Wednesday, answer your mule and donkey questions. And uh, if you've got any questions, go ahead, put them in the comment section. The first thing we ask is that uh, you let us know that you're watching with your name, where you're watching from, and what the weather's like. Number two, ask those questions. And number three, like, subscribe, and share. So on YouTube, make sure you subscribe and like the video. And then on Facebook, make sure you like and then share with uh, share with some other folks. Uh, make sure that they know that you found the best kept secret in all of the <laughs> equine world. So uh, let's hop back over on Facebook here. We've got a lot of really good conversation happening. Um, James is watching, says it's really windy in Holden, Missouri. Hello there, guys. Glad to have you here, James. Uh, Johnson's Taxidermy, J Sherman Johnson, Norman, uh, Oklahoma, 72 degrees, and the fish are biting. Like to hear that. Okay. Tina's watching, says Ooh. we have a very large mule we got months ago. He will ride really good, but out of nowhere, he will bolt off into the woods and will take you off. Uh, and will take you off. Last week, a vine wrapped around my husband's neck and snatched him off the back of the mule. What can I do? Oh my, yeah. well, building a foundation, folks. Um, that's what you're gonna have to do. Uh, start from the ground, uh, my... my um, ground foundation suggest, starting kit. You bet. My suggestion is, folks, don't go back in the saddle. It used to be when I was younger, hey, you got bucked off, climb back in the saddle. Boy, get back. Don't no, don't do that. Don't do that. Go back and fix the feet. The feet are the problem. The feet are wanting to go. So you take your come along rope <clears throat> and you watch the video of the problem meal building your foundation and it shows you how to do it. It shows you how they get respectful of that, uh, of that halter. And the reason I said halter, folks, is you always start with the mule and donkey's nose. Always do all your work with the nose. Now, then you progress into the snaffle bit, then you progress into the finish bit. Now, uh, the other reason, the other thing you want to think about, what did it take off at? What was it scared of? Sometimes people say clear blue sky. I'll tell you what happens. We didn't ride a breaching, and all of a sudden now the saddle went forward, and the breaching uh, wasn't there, so the saddle hit the scapula, it scared the mule, it scared the donkey, they took off running. Oh, but I was riding flat ground, Steve. No, Steve. no. Flat ground or not, you ride with a breeching all the time because mules and donkeys are V-shaped in their shoulders. Horses are A-shaped in their shoulders. So that saddle is going to go forward. It will. So breeching is important. So when that, when that saddle hits that scapula, uh, you can even have a breeching on and not have it properly adjusted. Hits the scapula, scares the animal, flight and fright kicks in. Now, sometimes they go to buck him, sometimes they go to run it off. Neither one of them's good, but it, the, the, if you don't go back and fix it on the ground, you're gonna have more problems. Don't think riding is gonna fix it. 
Wet saddle blankets don't fix anything. Go back with your ground foundation and build a new foundation. That's good. Um, let's see here. Kate chimed in. She was uh, asking the question about the driving in a harness. She said, great explanation, Steve. Thank you. Uh, over here, uh, Tina actually had sent in that email. And uh, Tina, I'm glad that you were watching because you caught Steve's answer. So uh, wanted to make sure that you knew we had your question there. And I'm glad that you're here. Uh, Linda asked the question, do mules pack more kicking power than horses? And can't can they control how hard they kick? Two of my horse mares are trying to decide who is boss. Sometimes with lots of running and kicking, occasionally they'll chase Theo the mule. Theo is much bigger, but he just runs away unless they corner him. If he can't get away, he will kick. I don't mind letting the two evenly sized mares sort themselves out, but I wonder if the mule kicks more powerfully. He doesn't want to fight. He just wants to get away. What do you think? You know what? When a mule kicks, he knows exactly where he kicked it. It's not like horses that just seem to throw it out and go. Uh, uh, they all are very powerful. Uh, I had uh, an old friend of mine, an old cowboy, says, You know, Steve, I went to pick up the front feet of, my, of this mule, and I still got the use of my nose. In other words, that back foot come up and literally scraped across the edge of his nose, you know, and they can do it that well. Uh, mules are very subservient to horses. That's why the mule runs, tries to run from them. Can they kick? Yes. They can kick just as much as a horse. But the one thing about it, when they kick, they know exactly how much they did it and how they did it. I do not, folks. <clears throat> and I know a lot of you ain't going to like this because you've got nice big pastures and all this stuff. These animals are always, always, always trying to be the top of the pecking order. And they do that by chasing each other, by biting and kicking and this sort of thing. Well, I can't tell you how many people have contacted me over the years, Dave, that have animals that have been bit and kicked. Matter of fact, I just had somebody here just recently email mm -hmm. me, said they got all these marks on the rump of their mule. Well, it was a horse biting them, you know. I don't put my animals in with all together. I keep them each in a separate stall. I feed them individually. That way I can keep an eye on their feed. I can keep an eye on their water. And I keep them from hurting each other. They don't mean to do it, but they do. And, and if you take a really good animal that got kicked and got a broken leg or got kicked and he's maimed now for life, uh, it's not a good thing. I personally do not keep my animals together. And for, for that reason right there, is my most major because veterinarian bills can be very expensive. <laughs> yeah. 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 And we and we do talk quite often about having them separate. I mean, for the purpose of feed, but there's a whole lot of other reasons why you would want to keep them uh, separate as well. And um, yeah. and I think and one of the things that you about, said, Dave, you, know, you do one thing right, but you're creating yeah. 10 other problems. Yeah. You know, you, you're putting them out there in a pasture thinking, okay, they're good, but <clears throat> they're not getting the proper feed. They're not getting the proper water. You know, you're, you're not able to keep track of them. They can hurt each other. Mega problems. So just that one little, oh, I'm going to be, I'm going to let him run free. No, 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 no. They don't need to run free, folks. They don't. This modern mule and donkey, we have modern feed. We're feeding them, and, uh, and we can feed pellets and this sort of thing, and we can keep these animals uh, safe. We can feed them correctly, which it needs to get done. Very good. Uh, Lane's got a question. Will Vic in the mule's nose work? Uh, Lane's watching from Spring River, Oregon. No, it, the Vic's in the nose doesn't work. I've, I can tell you we've had just a big a, a train wreck with using blood on the nose, Vic's on the nose, all that stuff. My favorite thing, if I have to, and I don't have my come along rope with them, is I blindfold them. And I get them packed. Only problem is, once that meat's on there, the rodeo's on. So you better throw a good double diamond <laughs> and, uh, and and make sure it stays into place. But there again, I take my come along hitch everywhere. But in the past, you know, we've blindfolded them pre, pre come along hitch. We've blindfolded them. We've put Vicks on their nose. We put blood on their nose. I had a buddy of mine go to put some some uh, blood on the nose of this one mule, mm -hmm. and the mule pawed him, pawed with both paws in the front, and then knocked him down and hurt him pretty good. 
you know. Um, so no, don't use the Vicks on the nose. If you have to, blindfold them. The best thing you can do, folks, put the come long hitch on them, get them to respect that come long hitch, and then any time you have the monsters come in their life, the come long hitch says no. Yeah, it's great because it's <laughs> it's not just the come along hitch for this purpose or the come along hitch for that purpose. If you've got that down, if you've got the ground foundation training, you're doing your tune-ups, you've got control over your communication, you're yeah. you're taking that role as the herd leader, it's that one solution, albeit maybe slightly adjusted for different applications, that one solution for a whole myriad of applications. Uh, the ground foundation starting kit. Now, folks, you'll see this in the comment section. That is the come-along rope, the rope halter, and the problem mule building a new foundation video. Here's the deal. A lot of times folks will say, oh, the come along rope, that sounds pretty good. I'm going to go ahead and get that. And then they'll come back and they'll say, hey, I have the come along rope. Now I want to get the rope halter and the problem mule. Don't buy just one. If you don't have all three, don't buy just one. Buy the bundle. We've we've discounted it. So it's uh, about you know, just a little bit, like 8%, 9% off there. Covers the cost of shipping, so to speak. We've put it together to make it easy for you to get those. Get all three. Don't buy just one. Make sure you have the come along rope, the rope halter, and the problem mule video. And if you go on the store and you read the reviews, it's not just Steve blowing smoke. There are reviews from people there saying this is the best. It's 20 bucks or something like that. I, I don't know. Go on there and look. The kit's just under 100. They say this is the best investment that I've ever made. I've already noticed a difference. Go get all three, start using them. You're going to notice a difference. Um, Jennifer says, loving my trail light saddle. We're glad to hear that, Jennifer. Uh, Mary's watching. Jana's watching. Um, hey, Jana. Uh, Haley Williams says, hey, Steve. We've got Kristen from North Dakota. Um, we've got uh, ch -ch -ch Margie. Do you have double the... Do you have the double twisted wire snaffle in small size, sizes? Mine's only 13.2. Does the size matter there on a double? Well, I have it in small sizes for driving, full cheek snaffle bit. So yeah, I've got, I think I'm down to like four inches that I can have and, and that works good. On, on my YouTube, I show how to measure for a bit. Mm -hmm. and that'll give you a pretty good average. Yep. Uh, I'll find that I'll find that video here in a second. We've got Kristen watching. Says awesome day in North Dakota and a lot and have a large mule we brought bought back in January, but looking for proper tack. Uh, Kristen, I've got something that I want to send your way. Now it's the mule saddle training course, and uh, you might think you know well I'm talking tack. I'm not talking saddle. Well the the thing that I have learned from spending time with Steve, from asking questions, from recording Steve's videos, from these. The thing I have learned is that it is not one piece that does the trick. It is all of the pieces in concert together respecting the unique differences of the mule, the unique differences of the donkey over the horse. Time and time again, we'll have folks say, well, I've got this, that, and the other thing for my horse. I just need to get a britchin for my mule. Well, here's the thing. If you're putting on, well, number one, you've got a, 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 a horse saddle. And so fundamentally different bone structure in the mule than the horse. But the breaching is not going to connect properly using that horse saddle as it is using one of Steve's saddles. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put a link in the comment section here. It's the Mule Saddle Training Course. And these are 13 videos. It's all free. Walks you through understanding the needs that your mule has, the needs your donkey has, and then how those needs are catered to through the saddle, through the tack. So Mule Saddle Training Course. And here is the link. Go get this course. It's free. All the videos are really fun to watch, and it's just it's full of great information. You're going to get done, and you're going to say, oh, my goodness, I would have never known any of this, and you're going to be better for it. Um, let's see here. Man, time has just so, gone Dave, by. I had Go a, ahead. Yeah. I had a lady email me, and uh, she said, I bought this really beautiful saddle, and it was one of my trail rider saddles, and I happened to have bought it in a tax store, a used one. And she says, but it don't fit my horse. It bridges the horse. And I said, yes, ma'am, you're right exactly. My saddle does not fit uh, a horse. 
And she says, well, what can I do? I said, sell it to somebody who rides mules, you know, and get yourself a, a, a horse saddle. And folks, that's right, that's right there is, I'll send you that, that link there, Dave, when that lady emailed me. She said, it, it don't fit my horse. No, it don't, you know. Just like when you go to put a horse saddle on a mule, you've got a different bone structure there, you know. Uh, and then one guy told me that he likes to have uh, – one single strap coming back to the to the breaching well the problem is that makes the saddle dance in the back you know so all of my stuff folks is what i've designed from what i learned from the mule so you know it's there for you for your use awesome uh let's see here we've got uh, another question we're almost we're almost done here uh, another question from jim jim says is it okay to have a mule in the field by himself you talked earlier about yeah. keeping them separate from other animals, is it okay to allow him to be out there if he's by himself? Well, it's okay, you know, for being by himself, but only a short time. Listen, if I turn you loose on a smorgasbord, you're going to eat till you found her, right? I know I'm guilty of it myself, okay? They don't need to be out there eating all the time. They don't need to be. Turn them out there for a short time or put a muzzle on them, and, and, but don't let them out there to be eating all the time. They don't need it, you know? So what they need to be done is fed properly. Good. Okay, so I've got a question here. Um, we had a we had a, a, a question actually come in uh, and said, um, "Do y'all have any have a video that explains the terminology of side pass, turning on the forehand and hindquarters, and to and other things uh, your side of the mule? Let's see, and to do other things." your side of a mule is trained it will do and how to train them to do those things uh, legs reins etc and you said basic equitation to end this broadcast I want to just have you talk uh, a little bit about basic equitation what some of these terms are why they're important and give people kind of just so folks listen up we haven't really talked about this a whole lot specifically we've talked about bits and pieces over the last you know several dozen broadcasts so basic equitation steve would you just share with us what we need to know okay looking on the side of your mule you have your stirrup hanging down the middle and you have approximately 12 inches all together to move your leg to so when your stirrup is hanging here your leg is going to be here when you push against that that fender it's going to, that's called side passing, and the mule, the donkey side passes. When you put your hand, you put your leg here in the front, that moves the front end over. It's called turn on the hindquarters. When you put your, here's your stirrup, here's your fender right here, okay? When you put your, your leg here, then it's going to move the hindquarters over, and that's called turn on the forehand so extremely important you're going up the trail and all of a sudden you don't have much room for this animal other animal to come through and your mule's butts over here and you're trying to get the front end over here so that the people can, can go by you well unless you know how to use your legs you can't get that butt over to let them people come by you see so that's just one example besides that these animals are so awesome to ride why be satisfied with less than best? Why not ride them to their full ability? So now let's look. Here's three fingers. Okay. When I push on my leg right here, when I push on that leg, I'm going to side pass. When I move my leg up to here, I'm going to turn on the, on the hindquarters. So the back end is going to stay in place. The front end is going to move around. When I move my leg over to here, over this one here, and I'm going to, the front end's going to stay in place, and the back end's going to go around it. So, that's using your legs. When you use your hands, your hands, when you go to side pass, you take and you turn your hand like this, using a snaffle bit. Turn your hand like this, that brings up the shoulders, and they cross the front end, and the mule side passes. When you, when you turn it on the hind quarters, your, your left hand, you move on the left side, you pull straight back on it. When you do that, you put a small amount of pressure on that bit, and then you add your leg, and the hindquarters then will then move over out of the way. 
When you move the front end, you take your hands, pull straight up, then that moves the front end over with your legs moving the rest of the body. Now, your hands control from the from the uh, shoulder forward. Your legs control from the shoulder back. So your stops uh, and and your and your uh, turns and this sort of thing are from the neck forward come off of your neck ring. So that's the basics of it. Very good. That's awesome. You know what? I lied. I, we've got one more question, uh, one more that was emailed in. This one's from Casey. Casey says, Steve, I've recently purchased your come along to work with my mule, Kevin. Yep, I've called you before. A few months back, he nearly kicked the farrier's head off. So rather than resort to what the farrier's recommendation, which was hobbling or drugs, I wanted to work on him on giving me his feet. Haven't been successful. When I see him lighten, uh, lighten that back leg up, I watch and he will give me a swift kick in my direction. He gets a tug on the come along rope and a firm no from me. No love. What's your recommendation on stopping a kicky mule? I need him to be safe. Uh, need him to be safe to be around. Please help me again. Thank you. Dave, we have that video. We do. Of me picking up the back feet of that mule. We do. Uh, it, it, folks, when you see it, it's better than a thousand words. And, uh, and, and, and if I was right there, I could tell you exactly the next step to do. But one of the big problems is, folks, is we're using a lot of drugs on these animals that we don't need to do. Sure, you're getting him. Here's it goes back to it again. Yes, you're getting him shod. And yes, you're doing the feet. But you're creating mega other problems. Why ride when you can't pick up the feet? Why ride? Spend your time making the animal safe. It's like taking your brakes and loosen them up to where you have no brake, but just a teeny bit. And But yet you can stop, but you can sure be a problem. If you can't pick up the feet, I don't ride. Fix the problems first. First fix the problems. That's good. So I'm putting a link in the comments section to this video that you were talking about, Steve. Um, it's, uh, it's about 13 minutes long. Let's see here. Actually, it's uh, just under 10 minutes. My, my apologies. Just under 10 minutes long, and it's all in real time. No cuts, no editing, um, and it's, uh, it, it's, it's a good watch. It's really worth it. We got a couple final comments here. We had Mark Miller chime in, says, if you ride with a horse saddle on a mule, it will get you hurt. Uh, we've heard that multiple times, Mark. Thank you Mark for, uh, tell you. Thank you for yeah, sharing Mark's that. We good. also have... Uh, Let's see here. Well, it's Haley's profile, so I don't know if it's Mark commenting on Haley's profile or Haley over on YouTube says, took Longhorn cattle up on the mountain for another year. Just wanted to let you know that your great quality saddle and equipment held us up once again. That is yeah. the type of endorsement that we love to hear. It says, oh, hey, Steve, Mark Williams here. So Mark yeah, is over Mark on Williams. Facebook yeah. too. Mark is yeah. uh, Mark's watching us in uh, 2D right there, Facebook and YouTube. How about that? Yeah, Mark got me this cup right here. Hey, there you go. That is, yeah. and it's got the well, the Queen Valley Mule Ranch whale water. Whale water. <laughs> Yeah, well, well water. Well water yeah. uh, let's see. Jana Griffin is watching. Uh, we've got a cu uh, couple. Hey, did you see that nice picture that Jana sent me of her husband, her dog, and her mule? And her husband is, is petting on the, the dog, and the mule is loving on her husband. What a great picture. That's awesome. We love getting photos like that. Yep. We love getting photos like that. That's fantastic. Well, Steve, that's everything for today. That's all we had. Um, hey, take a look at this picture. Yeah, what do we got? We were talking about bits. Yep. Can you see this cartoon here of this bit? And uh, you can't really see it, can you? It's got that reflection there. Yeah, it's too bad. You know what? Next week, folks, I'm going to give you a closer picture of this. This is, uh, it's really good. It's back when I was uh, uh, selling these bits and stuff and uh, on, uh, on, on this magazine. And I had this picture. People were always saying, well, I need a bigger bit. And it's got the shanks going clear down to the ground. And it says, the, the, the caption is, I can stop him now. But hey, remind me, Dave, next week we'll show that picture where you can actually see it. Yeah. 
It's a great picture. It's not the bit, folks. It's your hands. It's great. Well, folks, Happy trails. That is, uh, that's all for this week. We would love to have you join us next week. Uh, we've got a lot of exciting things that we're working on for the ranch. We've got a lot of things uh, that we're excited to uh, to uh, be sharing with you. And there's no better place we love to connect than right here on Facebook, right here on YouTube, doing these live streams. We show up every single week uh, really just to serve and give. Uh, if you get Steve talking about why he likes doing this, um, what you'll hear him say is the uh, is basically the sentiment that Hey, a lot of people mentored me, a lot of people invested in me, and uh, the internet wasn't out there like it is today, uh, back when they were coming up. I've got the internet. I'm going to do everything I can to get everything that's inside of my head, everything that I've learned, everything that the mule has taught me, put that out there so even after I'm long gone, folks can really experience the joy these animals bring, uh, the mule and the donkey. And so that's why we do it every single week. Uh, no question is a dumb question. We want all of them. Yeah. So uh, come on back next week. Join us. Um, and, uh, yeah, spend a little bit of time with us. Steve, do you have anything else you want to say before we uh, sign off? No, I, we're, we're in good shape, folks. Uh, remember, your prayers mean something, folks. And praying for this country, for our leadership, uh, for our first responders, uh, and this sort of thing we have showed uh, as, as I went through town today, as I was in town going by the hospitals, there was great big signs saying thank you uh, to, the, to the men and women that are in those hospitals and this sort of thing. Uh, we also think about the first responders, the police officers, the fire department and this sort of thing. Uh, that's all really important. You folks, you, the power of prayer is extremely important. And, and, and y'all need to use it. We need to use it. Yep. Uh, and and this, this up and coming things that are coming up, uh, our, our presidents and our leaders, uh, they need your prayers. And uh, uh, First Timothy, the second chapter, points out that we need to be praying for our leaders. And folks, I'd like to see you get that done. Absolutely. Hey, Steve, real quick. I was going through making sure that I caught everything. I missed one question. I'm going to give you this oh. one question, then we'll sign off. Right. I apologize. This is from Stephanie. Stephanie asks, how would you help a mule that doesn't do well at all with a lawnmower or golf cart? Sidesteps back and forth or wants to back up and kick it? Well, again, the come along hitch, folks, and you cannot desensitize. I mean, I've seen, I've done videos to where you know, we can drive a, a quad back and forth and the come along hitch makes them stand still, but then you take a different quad, a different place, and and they'll move around again. As soon as you move them two feet, it's another world. So the best thing you can do is take the come along hitch and don't take them around in circles. When their feet move, bump, bump, bump. And the video, the problem mule video with that communication uh, kit, that really helps out. Um, just remember folks, that just because you fix them from not, from moving about one lawnmower, two more lawnmowers down a mile down the road, it's going to be a different situation. Uh, just because, you know, you they do not uh, get it in their mind because they don't have the cranial lobe uh, to tell the right side, the left side, do the left side, the right side, do them to know that 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 is not a problem anymore. Okay. There we go. Awesome. Thanks, Steve. Everyone, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next you week. Betcha. Take care. Bye bye now. Bye bye.